If you'd like to uh, follow along the reading of God's Word, if you would turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Going to be looking at verses 38 through 42. Would you please pay careful attention to this reading because this is the Word of God. Mark 9, beginning in verse 38, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to hinder him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who shall perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if, with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, from week to week, we don't want to forget what it is that the Lord is showing us in his word. To hear something and to understand it for the moment isn't going to do us a lot of good. It may do us some eventual good when we remember it again. But if it's going to do us the most good, we have to remember what it is that we've heard and we need to apply it. We need to actually live it. Now last week as we were looking at the Gospel of Mark, we saw something that was very, very important. And that is humility. The fact that we need to be humble. Now the problem is that everyone in the world, I think Christians included, want to be great. We want to stand out. We want people to notice us. We want to be remembered after we've left this world and gone into the next. Now in the world, this means taking advantage of your neighbor. It means putting yourself forward and shoving other people out of the way, getting people to look at you rather than to look at the Lord. But remember, Jesus tells us that in his kingdom, it's just the opposite. The kingdom that you are in by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is entirely different here. The one who would be the greatest is the one who humbles himself the most to become the servant of all. The one who lifts other people up at their own expense, you see, at the expense of their own credit and their own glory, the one whose life's purpose is to do everything that they do, not for recognition for themselves, but rather for the glory of God. You realize that glorifying God simply means giving him the honor, giving him the credit, giving him whatever praise comes your way, you give it to him. Because it's not you who did it, but rather it's the Lord. So you take the back seat. You retreat into the shadows. You do your best to give honor to others and to put the Lord out front. Jesus says, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So do you want to be truly great with the kind of uh, greatness or at least the kind of honor that is going to last beyond this world? Well, this is the path you must take. It is the path Jesus took. And of course, Jesus now is the one who is honored most in the kingdom of heaven and will be throughout eternity. Now again, this morning we're going to learn that there is one, well, several more things that the Lord needed to teach his disciples as he is on his way south now towards Jerusalem in order to be betrayed into the hands of sinners that he might be crucified. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his eventual crucifixion. Something else they needed to know that they might be better prepared to serve him when he was gone. And the particular principle he's teaching this morning is how they should view other believers who may not necessarily be in their particular group. Uh, this morning we see the disciples struggling with something of a cliquish attitude. You know, we're 
we're the in-group, we're the ones who are with Jesus, everybody else is on the outside. Now that became a problem when they saw somebody else who was casting out demons. Now this guy wasn't doing it in his own strength. He was doing it in the name of Jesus, which means he was serving the Lord. There is a little bit of um, perhaps confusion here when we look at this particular individual because Jesus does say about him that there is no one who shall perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak evil of me, which seems to assume that perhaps in a longer period of time he might be able to do this. Was this person saved or not saved? Well, don't forget to cast out demons. You don't necessarily have to be saved in those days. Judas certainly performed many miracles, and um, he was not saved. He cast out many demons, and yet Jesus said of him, it would have been good for him if he had never been born. Doesn't mean that this person was necessarily converted, but certainly he was doing the will of Christ. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was that he was doing it, but he was not with them doing it. He was not following them. He was not in their group. And so they tried to stop him. Now again, why did this situation come up? Why did the disciples see that happening? Why is Jesus having now to address it? Except that it was providentially arranged in order to teach them another important lesson and through them to teach us. The Bible contains everything that we need to know for life and godliness. We need to know this particular point. Well, he pointed out again, if this man had performed a miracle in casting out this demon in his name, that he would not soon turn against him. And then he went on to say this, the one who is not against us is for us. This man was really on their side. Now, this is something we need to learn today because of the fact that there are so many churches, many who name the name of Christ, many who are actually true believers, as well as you know, many in churches that aren't. But just because they are not with us, just because they're not doing things exactly the way that we do them, just because they don't believe the same things that we believe or attend the same church that we attend, doesn't mean that they do not belong to the Lord or that they're not worthy of being received as brothers and sisters in the Lord and that they're not worthy of our love and support. I mean, thank the Lord that the body of Christ is far larger than this particular fellowship or this particular denomination. This morning, let's consider how we should view believers from other churches. I just want to look at two things. First one is fairly obvious, and that is that everyone who believes in the Lord is a part of his body. I think that goes without saying sort of a an axiom you might say. If you believe in the Lord, you are saved. And so secondly, we should make sure that we treat them as though they are saved and as, they, as though they, well, as though they are, are part of the body of Christ because in fact they are. So first of all, let's see that everyone who trusts or believes in the Lord Jesus Christ is a part of his body. I think sadly, uh, especially in the reform camp, I think we're guilty of this. That we can find within ourselves perhaps as much or more of a party spirit than people experience in the world. Now, there are those two particular areas that, that everybody, I think, struggles with, at least, well, adults do, who uh, are aware of, of these things perhaps more than children. The two subjects that you want to avoid, as it seems, you know, more than any other in conversation, and that, of course, is religion and politics. And the reason why is because people's feelings run so deep and strong. Convictions regarding these things are so strong that when you talk about them, it often leads to arguments and ill will. Now, being Christians, the Word of God is very dear to our hearts. I mean, it's important to us. And it's very likely that we're going to be offended when we see the truth of God misrepresented. I only have to uh, draw your attention to Augustus Toplady and his opinion toward John Wesley. I I'm not sure that he wrote him out of the kingdom of heaven, but he was very strongly opposed to his teaching because he was robbing God of his glory. 
that was very important to Top Lady. So he wrote some pretty strong things against him. But we do need to be careful when it comes to these things because even though Christians are divided into different denominations because we have different beliefs, different convictions on what the Word of God says, we are all still members of the same body of Christ if we believe in the same God. Now remember, we do have to, you know, we have to be Christians in order for this to be the case. We have to be believing the truth, at least those essential elements that make one a Christian. We cannot believe in a God that is Unitarian and be a Christian. We must believe in the triune God, the one who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that are not just different modes of, of one person, but who are three distinct persons. We have to trust in the true Jesus Christ, the same one who is God and man as our Savior and as our Lord. If we are looking to him and to his obedience and his death on the cross to save us from God's judgments, then we are Christians. And of course, now here's another key thing that separates us from perhaps a large portion of the church. We have to also be walking with him in obedience to his commandments from the heart. This is the reason why the Lord saved us in the first place, and it is the evidence that we are Christians, is when we trust in the true God and his son Jesus Christ and him alone for our salvation, but we are also walking with him in holiness. The purpose of redemption was to turn us from sin to righteousness, and if that has not happened in our lives, then we are not believers regardless of what it is we believe. Jesus says, how can you call me Lord and do not do what I say? See, Jesus is no one's Lord if they refuse to submit to him. But on the other hand, if any man or woman or child believes in the Lord Jesus Christ in these things that we've just talked about and are trusting in him and are, are trusting in him alone for their salvation, whether they're a Pado baptist or a Baptist, whether they're Presbyterian, Independent, or Episcopal, whether they're Calvinist or an Arminian, whether they're Covenantal or Dispensational, whether they're pre-mill, ah-mill, or post-mill. And this may be going a little bit, well, it's not too far, but it's, it is a more radical thought. Even if they're in a church that is an apostate church, if they're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, and in the case of the apostate church, that would be in spite of that church, and they're repenting of their sins, and they're walking with the Lord in holiness, they are a part of the body of Christ. And they are members of the one church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, as we read in our meditation, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. By the way, that's not talking about water baptism. That's talking about spirit baptism. He's the one who puts us in the body of Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. All these class distinctions don't apply for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. Heirs according to promise. You are the true children of Abraham and as such are part of his body. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 12, and 14, 12 through 14. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. So again, it doesn't mean that everybody who is in every particular church under heaven is necessarily a brother or sister in Christ, but it does mean that the children of God are spread throughout all of those denominations. And certainly we ought to recognize that. They don't have to believe exactly the way we believe. They don't have to do things exactly the way we do it. They don't have to be a part of this denomination or this particular church. 
sadly, there are many denominations that, that do see themselves exclusively as the children of the Lord and see everybody else as basically outside the kingdom of heaven. One of the ways that's sort of practiced is when um, if you become a part of their church, even if you've been baptized in, in your church, you have to be rebaptized because they won't recognize your baptism because you weren't in a church. We have to avoid this kind of exclusive thinking. It's not that way at all. If we are trusting in the true Savior, we are all believers and members of one another. When we read all these passages about the body of Christ and the fact that Christ has many members, we're not talking about an individual fellowship. We're talking about the whole church, the whole body of Christ. We are members with one another. Now let's move to our second point and what this means. How should you treat then these people, these brothers and sisters in the Lord? Well, you should treat them, our Lord says, in some respects, not in all respects, but in many respects, as you would treat Jesus Christ himself. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? Now, you may not be the member, maybe members of the same denomination or of the particular church, but as I've just mentioned, you are members of the same body. They may not be in your church family, but they are brothers and sisters in the Lord who have the same Father, the same Savior. You all partake of the same Spirit. You are all one in Christ. And so how should you treat those who are members of the same body as you? Well, for one thing, Jesus says you should try to help them serve the Lord and certainly not get in their way. As the disciples did when they tried to stop this one man in this passage, even if they're not doing it the way that you might do it, they're still doing his work, trying to do his work to the very best of their understanding, to the very best of their ability. There was a former member here who, um, you know, there's, there's certain things that stand out about different individuals over the years. And there was this one particular individual, most of you probably wouldn't even know who he is, but I won't mention his name, but he said this oftentimes. When he'd see somebody doing evangelism, and they weren't doing it exactly right. You know, didn't have the right principles. Maybe the message wasn't the best it could be. And maybe the, the way it was, he was doing it wasn't the best it could be. He said, hey, brother, I like the evangelism you're doing better than the evangelism I'm not doing. You see, at least you're doing something. And, and I'm not. So how can I criticize you? You see, oftentimes, though, we criticize the way that people are doing things. And maybe they're not doing it the best way they could. But the fact is they're doing it and we're not doing it. So how can we stand in the place of the critic and criticize them when we're not even willing to try something, to try to do what the Lord calls us to do? We need to be careful. Don't criticize them and don't get in their way if you're not willing to go out and do the work yourself. And why would you want to stop them from doing this work? Because if they're not against you, they're for you. I mean, they're helping you get the work of the kingdom done. That's partly your responsibility too, and you, so you should be happy that it's going on because you can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. We can't do it on our own. We need help. We need all of our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ to be doing this work. Now, if what they're doing is so wrong that it's actually hurting the work, then you do need to correct them, but you need to do it Gently, remember they are members of the same body that you're a member of. They are like your arm or your leg or something. You are connected to them. When one member rejoices, we all rejoice. When one member suffers, we all suffer. When mom, one member is doing it wrong, we need to help correct them, but do it in a gentle way. Not only because it's more effective, but you gotta remember if it wasn't for God's grace, you wouldn't know any better either. So don't you know, become prideful and look down at them and criticize them, but humble yourself and become a servant to them to help them do what the Lord calls them to do. So you should not try to stop them. You should try to help them. Secondly, you need to consider them as precious, as precious as Jesus considered them to be precious. Look at what he says in verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble... It would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. 
Now, we did see last time that Jesus here may likely have been speaking about actual children who believe in him, and certainly that is the case. But remember, this would apply to anyone who believes in Jesus of whatever age. Do not stumble those who are precious to Jesus Christ, because if they're precious to him, they should be just as precious to you. And so you should do everything you can to keep them from stumbling and everything you can to encourage them and to build them up in Christ. Again, uh, one thing that the founder of this denomination said was uh, we have two tasks set before us. One is we need to convert the lost. We need to get the gospel out and see the lost saved. The second one is we do need to try to uh, instruct, try to teach the rest of the church to do the right thing. So let's remember that as we set our hearts to do that, that even though they don't see it the way we see it, we still need to love them. We still need to count them as precious. We still need to try to encourage them, build them up, and help them see it the right way. But then thirdly, Jesus says, even more than this, you should receive them as you would receive Jesus Christ himself. Jesus identifies himself with his body. Uh, they are the members of his body. They are his children. Remember in the, uh, the passage in Matthew um, 25, the sheep and goat judgment, when the Lord is speaking about the sheep, he says to them, well, actually he says to, well, he says to them amongst themselves, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it, that is these acts of mercy, to one of these brothers of mine, by the way, he's not talking about the whole world here. He's talking about those who are Christians, those who are his brothers. That doesn't include the whole world. To the extent that you did it, these acts of mercies, to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. That's how Jesus identifies the members of his body with himself. He will also say to the goats, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So if there's a member of the body of Christ who is in need of one of these mercies and you don't do it to him, you are not ministering to Christ. That's how closely Jesus identifies his people with himself. He says in the previous verse of our particular passage in verse 37, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Which means not only when you show love and concern and seek to minister to someone who is a member of Christ's body, not only are you ministering to Jesus, but you're actually ministering to the Father. You're not only receiving Jesus Christ, but you're receiving the Father as well. And then he says, just as he said in the passage dealing with the final judgment, that those who show kindness to him, because they are his people, will receive a reward, verse 41 of our text. But whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Now the same is true with regard to you. If somebody shows you an act of kindness because you are a child of the Lord, he's actually showing Jesus, you see, that kindness. He's actually doing it for Jesus. But as far as we're concerned, when we do it for one of Christ's uh, people, for one of his children, for one of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, when we minister to them, we are ministering to Jesus himself. So how does that, you know, what does that say about how we should treat those who are trusting in Jesus, even if they should not be a part of this church or this denomination? I mean, we should certainly treat those in this denomination that way, but also those in whatever denomination they may be. By the way, let's not forget there are also believers who, because of misinstruction, aren't in any church at all. Uh, again, we should receive them as, as members of the body of Christ if they're trusting in the Lord, but we should try to help them get into a church because that's what the Lord wants them to do. But again, treat them gently and in love because 
they are members of the body of Christ. And the way you treat them, you are treating your Lord. So be careful. Now, what about the differences that exist between us? I mean, that's the reason why we're spread into these different denominations in the first place. How should we deal with these differences? We do have to recognize that we are in a fallen world and we are still sinful in many ways. And because of our sin, we are not going to be able to see eye to eye on every issue. Sadly, even if we happen to agree, we can still disagree because of our pride. And that's one of the reasons. One of the reasons, not the only reason. We actually, not too long ago, saw when we were studying the reasons why people reject Christianity, an excuse not to believe. It's because you all, you all disagree. I mean, look at all of you, all these different denominations. You all disagree. If you guys can't agree, why should I join this kind of an organization? Well, the fact is these denominations exist because there are disagreements, but not all of them because they're disagreements. Some of them because of historic movements, remember, and some of us believe exactly the same way for the most part, but we're still in different denominations just because of history, because of the way we, we came about. But again, as long as we're going to be on earth, as long as we are not perfected in heaven, denominations are going to exist because we're not going to agree on everything. I mean, we're, we will agree one day, thankfully, when we finally reach glory. But on this side of glory, we're going to have denominationalism. But even if we can't agree on everything so that we can't do everything together, we can still do a number of things that are very important to, well, individually, or I should say as individual denominations for the glory of God. We can certainly pray. We can evangelize. We can do the work of missions. We can advance the kingdom of heaven. It's what the Lord wants us to do. But we can also, while we're doing these things, do our best to try to encourage others in the work that the Lord has given all of us to do. We can pray for one another that the Lord might strengthen us until the work is done, until we finally see things as they really are when we are together with the Lord in heaven. And even though we may disagree again, and may be tempted to criticize, let's not forget that these people that we're disagreeing with, if they are trusting the Lord, are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, members of the same body, engaged in the same work, empowered by the same spirit. Is the spirit of God working in those that aren't doing things exactly biblical? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, he is. He wouldn't be working in us if that were the case because none of us are exactly biblical, even though we're trying to do the best that we can. We may disagree, but let's not forget we are members of that same body. We are doing the same work. We have the same Lord who has given us the same command to make disciples of all the nations. We need them to get this work done. We need to pray for them. We need to encourage them as we have the opportunity we need to make sure we don't fall into that attitude the disciples had and said, because you're not of us, we're going to try to stop you. Because you're not of us, we're going to criticize you. Because we're not doing it the, you're not doing it the way we would do it, then we're going to stand against you. Now, again, if they're doing something wrong, we need to correct them. But if it's, if it's only a matter of preference, if it's only a matter of, you know, well, you're doing it this way, I might do it a different way, don't get in their way. But encourage them, strengthen them, and help them. So may the Lord help us to do what we can, not only to fellowship amongst ourselves and to help one another with our gifts, but also to help every single member of the body of Christ do the work that he has called them to do, to serve and honor him, as well as, as we seek to do the same thing. Well, may the Lord give us the grace then to eschew, to avoid, to stand away from a party spirit, and to uh, embrace one another as the body of Christ. Let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer and let's ask for the Lord's help to do that.